Before we get into today's show, I just wanted to let you know about our new podcast that I'm so excited about called Mindbenders. Uh, it's a podcast about stories of synchronicity that can bend minds. You can find Mindbenders podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcast, and mindbenderspodcast.com. Submit your mind-bending story today by emailing us at mindbenders at path11productions.com or by calling us. Leave your story on our voicemail. It's okay if it's a long one. We'll call you back. 1-323-713-1113. Again, that's 1-323-713-1113. Also, the 2020 Virtual Afterlife Awareness Conference has ended, but the replays are still available at path11productions.com slash AC2020. For $129, you can watch just over 17 hours of streamed videos from professionals including Robert Moss, Austin Wells, Edie Nathan, Brian Smith, and Daniel 4 PhD, just to name a few of the presenters. Visit path11productions.com slash AC2020 to see the complete list. Topics include dealing with grief, working with death doulas, psychic children, and suicide. These videos won't last forever, but they can be watched anytime at your convenience until September 30th, 2020. Visit path11productions.com slash AC2020 for all the information. And if you haven't seen our documentaries yet, the Path Series Trilogy, you can watch all three for free at Gaia.com. Just sign up for their one-week free trial. You can cancel at any time and watch The Path Afterlife, The Path Beyond the Physical, and The Path Evolution. Oh, and before we get into our show, I wanted to remind you to use your 25% off discount code PATH2PORTAL, all caps, PATH, the number two portal, path to portal at reconnection.com for trainings by Dr. Eric Pearl. They absolutely loved being on our show and they wanted to give back to our listeners. So you guys are lucky and are getting 25% off if you go to their website, reconnection.com. All of these links are listed in the show notes for today's episode. So enough of all these announcements, let's get to our show for today. And thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome our guest to the show today, Howard Storm. He has a really interesting story. And I know a lot of you really enjoy listening to people who have had a near death experience that have lived through it, come back to tell about their story. And that's the type of show that we have today. So Howard Storm was in the hospital in Paris dying in 1985, when he had his near death experience. And his near death experience, he's going to tell us more in detail about about it, but it involved him being tormented in jail. He called out to Jesus, being saved, given a life review. He had all of his questions answered. And from that experience, he ceased being an atheist and is now a Christian pastor. He's also written four books based on his experience and has participated in over 30 overseas mission trips and countless missions in the U.S. So Howard, I just wanted to touch upon that just really briefly because I know that you have an amazing story and I want you to go right into what happened back in 1985. Okay. Um, I'll make it um, brief because I could talk about it for hours and hours and days. Um, one of the interesting things about near death experiences, they never fade in your memory. Right. Like I can't remember where I put my shoes this morning, <laughs> but um, the near death experiences like it happened yesterday always, and it's been 35 years for me. So um, at the time, I was a 38-year-old college professor and doing very well in academia. I was also um, a practicing artist, and I had three galleries showing my work, and I was winning awards and selling work, and it looked like my career was taking off. I'd got some paintings in museums and things like that, so wife and two kids all looked good, but when I was a teenager, I gave up on the Christian faith due to a lot of um, family stuff and, and the times and just became a, a self-centered, materialistic hedonist, um, lived for my own um, self. Nobody else, just myself and for my own gratification. And uh, 
it was um, a great road for success. The only problem with it was it left me very empty inside. And there was, I had a lot of um, melancholia, which I just thought was um, normal to be kind of deep down inside, just sort of mildly depressed or sad all the time. Um, so on June 1st, 1985, I was taking a group of students on a three-week art tour of Europe with my wife. And on the next to the last day, we were in Paris. And at 11 o'clock in the morning, I had a perforation of the duodenum, which is the small stomach. And a perforation means, of course, a hole. And when it happened, I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. It was just I went from talking to a student to um, falling to the floor, thrashing, cursing, screaming, yelling in absolute terror because the pain was the most acute pain I'd ever experienced because the uh, gastric acids and juices are leaking into your abdomen. So I was beginning to digest myself on the inside. Oof. It really hurts. Anyhow, my wife called a, the desk at the hotel. They called a emergency service and a doctor came right away. He got me off the floor, examined me. He knew immediately what was wrong with me and told me that I had to have surgery like immediately or I would die. And that I would only live a few hours if I didn't have the surgery. So like, yeah, let's do it. So um, ambulance came and they carried me because I couldn't walk because of the pain. Um, other hotel and ambulance, we went several miles across Paris at 70 miles an hour with the sirens blaring, went to emergency. Two doctors examined me there, said the same thing the uh, doctor at the hotel had said. They were very nice, x-rayed me, took my medical history and said that um, I had to have the surgery like now um, or else it would be fatal. Because what, what happens is you become septic, um, which means infected to a point where your body can't recover. Um, and so they took me away on a cart uh, a few blocks away to the surgical hospital. And because it was a Saturday and because it was um, the French system of socialized medicine, unbeknownst to me or the doctors in emergency, there was no surgeon available on that Saturday. Oh, no. So when I went into that hospital, I was never assigned a doctor, which is not a good thing because um, Neither in emergency nor in surgery was I given anything, um, including um, a pillow, a sheet, a blanket. I mean, I was just put on a bed to await a doctor to come so that I would become someone's patient. And uh, so there were no orders for me, basically. So that was the situation I was left in for the next 10 hours. Every doctor I've talked to in the United States has said, um, I only should have lived a few hours and I should have died. You know, so it's a miracle that I did live that long. Um, the pain, which had started off as a point in my abdomen, became my whole abdominal cavity from my groin to my shoulders. And um, the pain was so excruciating that it was very, very difficult to breathe. And I couldn't, the pain was so overwhelming, I couldn't even think. All I could do was focus on breathing because I had enough sense that if you stop breathing, um, that's a bad thing, you'll die. And I was terrified of dying because um, to me, dying meant um, the end, no more, you know, the big nothing. And like turning off a switch. So 8.30 that night, a nurse came into the room and said they were uh, very sorry, but um, they were unable to locate a doctor and they would try and get one the next day. Well, that was, I mean, I, I, I mean, I knew I was dying, you know, and I, it was getting really, really difficult to breathe. I mean, it was, it was a super struggle, but um, because of my terror of dying, you know, I, I was motivated to keep trying to breathe. And um, when she said that, I, I knew it was, Finished. She left the room. I told my wife it's time for us to say goodbye and tell my parents I love them, etc. And a little f brief farewell. And she sat down in the chair and wept. Um, and I closed my eyes and stopped 
trying to breathe and um, I went unconscious. I don't, of course, I don't know how long I was unconscious. And um, I woke and I felt wonderful, better than I'd ever felt in my whole life. And I was just incredibly happy because I'd gone from the worst pain I'd ever experienced, an unimaginable pain to like, you know, I feel great. Matter of fact, as I began to examine myself, um, realized that my senses were heightened. Um, sight, hearing, taste, touch, everything. Uh, and I thought, wow, I'm not better. I'm way better, you know? I'm mm -hmm. better than I've ever been. Then I noticed in the bed that I had been in, I'm standing in the middle of the room, there was a body. And I looked at the body carefully, and strangely, it looked exactly like me. I also knew that the body was me. It was gone, just a big steel corrupting hunk of meat. And that was very disturbing. But I couldn't understand why that body looked like me since I was fine. So who was that that looked like me? You know, and I was like trying to think of how, the, there was no way to explain that. And it was very confusing and, and made me angry. I tried to communicate with my wife and my French roommate in the room, who was a very kind, retired Frenchman. And neither of them responded to me at all, which made me very angry because why won't they talk to me? Why are they ignoring me? I'm telling them I'm, I'm doing much better. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm healed. I'm great. I'm like, you know, everything's wonderful now. It's, it's okay. And they like just stared through me as if they couldn't see me, which of course they couldn't see me or hear me. Um, then I heard people outside the room calling me by name, and I went over to the doorway of the room, and there was a group of people, and the hallway was very gray, very dank, and they were staying conspicuously away from the light of the room going into the hall. And they said, uh, we've been waiting for you a long time. I said, I'm, I need a doctor. I'm sick. I'm supposed to have surgery. And they said, we know all about you. You've got to hurry. It's time for you to go. Let's go. You know, we've come to take you, etc. So I thought that they were um, hospital people to take me to the doctor, which I'd been waiting for basically all day. And so I went with them. They took me on a long journey, walking down the darkened hallway, which I came to realize was not the hallway because we never went up or down or right or left. We just, no walls, no ceiling, just in this darkness, walking, walking, walking for miles and miles and miles. And I uh, knew something was very wrong with this picture. You know, this is, this is not right. This is not good. And then the uh, tone of the people went from being authoritative, like, let's go, hurry up, to starting to get cruel and making um, really rude remarks about me and stuff like that, and I and I became very very fearful of these people because they're, they're they're clearly not good. They're, this is not this is not right. This is not a hospital, you know. And I said, I'm not going with you any further. And they said, No, you've got to go much further. And they started to push and pull me, and I fought back. And at first, we were punching, kicking. Um, I'm trying. There are a lot of them now. The, the, the um, assembly had grown considerably. I don't know how many because it was dark, but lots. And uh, of course, it was hopeless battle because there were so many of them. And then people started to uh, bite me. And when I say bite, I mean um, biting chunks out of me and started um, scratching. And then they started to uh, invade all of my orifices. And then I won't say any more about this because it's um, really, really obscene. But um, looking back on it, I sort of see them as um, the greeting committee in this um, prison, if you will. Um, and they were there to process me into one of their into their world, their world of hopelessness and domination and sadism. Um, they were people 
people always tell me that they were demons. And I said, no, they weren't demons. They were, they were people. And um, this is an awful thing for me to uh, admit, but I knew that they weren't people any different than the people that, that I associated with, the person that I had been self-centered, uh, out for themselves, out for domination, Another word for that is success in a way. I mean, success doesn't necessarily have to mean domination, but um, very often they go hand in hand, you know. Um, and that's what I, I was a bully. You know, I was an A-type a personality. I wanted to get my own way all the time. Um, eventually, there was nothing left in me to fight with. I was all ripped up and um, totally um, demeaned lying on the ground there, and I heard a voice say, pray to God, and I thought, I don't believe in God, and the voice said, pray to God, and I thought, I don't know how to pray, and the voice said, pray to God, and I thought, I haven't prayed since I was a kid, um, I don't know what that was, and I'm trying to think of uh, a prayer, because I, th I thought praying was like something that you um, memorized and repeated, That's you know, which I don't believe that, I mean, now I think prayer is anything but, um, at that time. That's what I thought. So um, I'm remembering all the things that I had memorized as a kid, like the Pledge of Allegiance and um, Shakespeare, and, you know, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, um, you know, and I come upon the Lord as my shepherd. That's it. I mean, just that phrase. And I, I said it. And the people around me were extremely agitated when I did that. And they were saying in very, very vulgar language, there is no God, nobody can hear you. And if you don't stop that immediately, we're going to make things much worse for you. But I also noticed that um, any mention of God was so offensive to them that they um, rapidly were backing away from me to get away from um, hearing that. So I started saying every Thing about God that I could think of. And this is all very crude, and um, I would never want to repeat the stuff that I said, but it was, I, I, I was throwing God and Jesus at them a lot, and they really didn't like it, and they retreated back into the darkness, and I realized they'd left me alone. And now I got to consider my situation, because I um, had no religious or theological um, component in my being at that time. What I figured was is that I... Um, had gone down the sewer pipe of the universe into the cesspool, and these people were taking me deeper and deeper into the septic system for processing. It was a very grim prospect, because I knew that sooner or later they'd be back, and there was more in store for me, which I didn't even want to begin to imagine. So it was a um, horrible, desperate situation. I thought about my life and thought about... Um, I was not the big shot that I had hoped to be or pretended to be. Um, and in many ways, I had failed um, in my relationships with my parents, my sisters, my wife, my children, my students. Um, it's just a big phony. Um, that's, what I, that's what I can conclusion. I was just a big, self-deceiving phony, you know? And... You know, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be in this place, although I knew that I belonged there. Um, and my mind, not consciously, but involuntarily went to myself as a little boy praying in Sunday school class. And what, what we were doing was we were singing, Jesus loves me. And when I, I could see it in my imagination and I could hear it, but more importantly, I could feel it. The, the simple faith of a child. And I wanted that. I didn't know if it was real. I didn't know if it was true, but it was something that it was a hope in a hopeless situation. So out of desperation, I called out to Jesus and said, Jesus, please save me. And to my 
amazement and delight. A tiny light appeared in the darkness and it got very, very bright, white light, impossibly bright, brighter than the sun. Um, came over me and out of it emerged hands and arms. And he reached down and touched me. And when he touched me, all the gore just began to vaporize away and I was restored physically. But much more importantly than the physical restoration was just that he filled me with a love that's indescribable. What's been one of the biggest frustrations of my life is that I've not been able to describe that love adequately because if I could, people would want it. Because it's, it's the best thing in the world. Um, and he picked me up put his arms around me, held me tight against his chest. I put my arms around him and he stroked my back like a mother or father would with their child and just loved on me. And I just fell madly in love with him. <laughs> have been so ever since. And um, I'm crying like a baby out of happiness. And then I realized we were moving directly upward without any uh, effort. And I also knew we were accelerating more and more and more. And I wanted to see where we were going. And eventually I got my composure enough to look up to where we're going. And I saw what I thought was a big galaxy of light. And then as I looked at it, I realized that they weren't um, stars, they were beings. Um, billions and billions and billions of them and, and in the center was this huge concentration of light and then I knew um, God was in that and I knew that it was heaven this whole thing that I denied all my adult life as being real was now in my face reality and I thought to myself I'm a piece of garbage he's made a terrible mistake he should put me back belong here because I felt so filth I mean I felt like a piece of filthy scum you know he was clearly so good <laughs> and I was not good and with that we stopped outside heaven which I refer to as home and he said we don't make mistakes you do belong here and he was speaking to me telepathically. I heard his voice in my head and um, he heard everything that I was thinking. And he also told me he knew everything I'd ever thought. And we began to converse and um, he's incredibly likable. Um, and I so enjoyed being in his company, my hero, my rescuer my savior and uh he said that he had people that he wanted me to meet and he called out and a group of angels came around and i had a life review which um after my childhood turned out to be very painful because um, i was such a huge disappointment um bottom line is i mean one of the things i learned from my life we were all created to be loving caring kind people to um, help one another in this little life of ours to grow and to love and to prosper. And I, I blew it. I, I, um, I flunked the course and I missed the lesson because I thought it was about me. It's not about me. It's about how we um, interact with love and kindness. And um, they shared their disappointment with me. And it was it's very hard to be amongst a group of incredibly good, loving, kind people and to know how much you've let them down um, willfully, you know. And when it was over, um, Jesus said, do you have any questions? And I said, I've got a million questions. So I asked him a million questions. Well, I asked him everything I could think of at the time. 
and that went on for a very, very long time. And he took me places and he showed me things. We went into the past, we went into the present, we went into the future. Asked him lots, lots of questions about him and the world and God. And he gave me a little tour of heaven, et cetera. And uh, told me things, some of which I don't talk about because sometimes it's too much for people to handle. You know, um, and then when I couldn't think of anything else to ask him, I said, I want to I wanna be in heaven forever. And he said, not now. you got to go back and um, learn how to live the way you were created to in the first place. So we had a big argument, and I argued as forcefully as possible um, for him to let me go to heaven. And he defeated all my arguments with um, better, bigger argument, uh, better, better reasons why it was best for me to come back and try and do this thing. So eventually he convinced me and I accepted it and I was back in the bed and immediately when I was back in the bed, back in the body, back in the pain, um, the nurse, same nurse came into the room, about a half an hour had gone by and said that a doctor has arrived at the hospital and you're gonna have the surgery. They prepped me for the surgery, which I had at 10 o'clock that night. The surgery was a disaster and I, left against their orders and wishes. I left that hospital after a week and came home to the U.S. very, very ill. Went right to my local hospital where I was for several months. Wow. Um, very, very sick. And then it took me, then I had to have more surgery to do repairs on the, uh, from, from the septus. Because I was very septic. That's what I was in the hospital for. And, uh, and I went back to my life and um, started going to church. And I I fell in love with the church. I loved being, being an art teacher is like the most fun job in the world. I mean, it's almost shocking that you get paid for it because it's like too fun. And I love being an art teacher, but um, I thought I could serve people better because church is about life and death and children and marriage and you know, the whole human drama, and I wanted to be a part of that. Um, and that's an interesting job because it's 24-7. You know, you get calls at 2 o'clock in the morning and stuff like that. You rush off to the hospital, et cetera. But, uh, so that's what I've done for the past 37 years. Well, sounds like you've lived a couple of lifetimes in that. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you, um, let's start off with one of my first questions. Um, when you kind of entered into this hell and then eventually remembered and heard this voice to pray, I've, I've listened to other people talk about, you know, maybe their own theories about near death experiences or when we die, we tend to be shown or go to a place of where our belief system is originating from there. So with you saying that you were an atheist and not really believing in God, do you think that you were shown this hell because it was the belief system that you were holding on to at the time of this anticipated death? Um, yes and no. I think that our belief system is extremely important, but I also think that there's um, a divine plan and a divine order, and that is the ultimate principles that guide our eternal destiny. Or let me put it another way. If we are um, loving, we go to love. And if we're not loving, we don't go to love. And the place without the love is really awful. But do you think we're always given a choice? Because, you know, back in your childhood, you had something that was integrated of a belief system in the church in prayer because you remembered yourself as a young boy praying. So it sounds like that even though you kind of went through this journey and you weren't really believing in God at the time of this death, there was still some memory in reference to God. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. And I had um, suppressed it. Mm -hmm. but, it was, um, but it never went away, um, which I believe is 
why it's so important for uh, parents to raise their children in uh, faith in God, because um, you're planting a seed, and someday they're going to be um, in a car accident, you know, and if they call up to God, they've got a better chance of survival than if they don't, you know. Someday they're about to make a really bad choice, like pulling the trigger or punching their wife in the face or, you know, abusing one of their children. And they need to call up to God and get straightened out. Um, we can't do this alone. It's not it's it's not just about us. It's it's all about relationship. It's about our relationship. Our life is about our relationship to our mother and father, our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, our um the other students in our school, the people that we work with. And most importantly, it's all about, um, you know, the the God um, principles in them, you know. Well, if let's say parents don't plant that seed, okay, and maybe you had the seed planted long ago. And from what I've heard many yeah. people say that believe in God, that it is a loving God. So here you are, yeah. right, at this, this death experience, yet it still seems like the love of God is still willing to give those people a chance, maybe who don't believe. Yes. Absolutely. God. Um you know, we talk about a second chance, but actually we've got um, unlimited chances, you know, to a to ask God in our lives. And I mean, I've talked to people that um, had had their faith in a in a cruel, tyrannical, horrible God. I mean, that's that's what they were taught and believed in, which is like grossly disgusting to me that people would teach a God like that, you know, and they rejected that God and stuff like that, but um, they've come to find out that God is very different. God's like Jesus, you know, sweet, kind, giving. Now, when you went from Paris back to the United States and went back to your doctor and where you were in the hospital for a couple of months, after having this interaction with God and knowing that, you know, you were still going through a lot of medical stuff, there was probably... You know, I would think that if you had that experience, you probably weren't afraid to die because you knew that you would go back home. And two, after having that conversation with God, you probably also knew that you were going to survive. My only um, anxiety was I knew I had to do a major remodeling of my character. And I'm talking about stripping it down to the studs. You know, I mean, we're, you know, this wasn't just like I, I couldn't just... Uh, paint the walls and call it, you know, new and fresh, I was going to have to rebuild. You know, I'd spent 38 years building up this uh, character, and now I was going to have to. And the thing that was hard was um, my old friends and my family didn't like it. Um, you know, they, they just, people told me endlessly, just be your old self. Didn't happen, you know. Why do, you, why do you want to talk about it? Why do you want to think about it? Why, why are you going to church? You know, like, just be your old self, you know, the old fun life. You know, I, I had a million dirty jokes and drank hard and partied and stuff like that. And I didn't do any of those things anymore. They didn't, they didn't like the new me. Um, wasn't fun anymore. Mm -hmm. um, people don't like change. And they especially don't like really radical change. So that... That was a hard part because I'm trying to think of how do, how do I live this new life? And um, it's a big adjustment. And were some of those changes very instantaneous? I mean, you know, clearly you had to go through this period of being in the hospital for several months and then coming out. But were there parts of that lifestyle that automatically like drinking was cut out completely sober um, or was it a gradual change over time? Mixed bag. Um, Blaspheming, zero, gone. I don't, I don't, I don't do it. I don't like it. Um, you know, I don't like to be around it. Um, I lost my um, desire for alcohol. So, like, I might have a beer, or a glass of wine once in a while, maybe a couple drinks a month, but just one, and just doesn't do much for me one way or the other. I have no desire for it. Quitting cigarettes was really hard. <laughs> that was tough. It took me. 
um, four months. I was down to one cigarette a day, and boy, that was murder giving that one up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, lots of challenges, but those things are all relatively superficial. Um, the important thing was how do I um, respond to other people, which means putting other people's interests and needs ahead of my own. That's that's still the challenge today. So let me ask you a couple questions about your wife. She was in the room with you right before you closed your eyes. You had said that you were saying goodbye and you had said that you weren't sure how long you were asleep for or went out for, but um, was she there witnessing the fact that you closed your eyes and you were gone? Oh yeah. yeah. And what was the time frame that she remembers that you were gone? Um, actually, we've ne we never discussed that. I don't know. Okay. She doesn't like to talk about it because she, um, she really doesn't like to talk about it. She doesn't like my experience, and she said that that day was the worst day of her life. She said, I tell everyone I went to hell. Well, she said, well, I was in hell. I mean, she, she had a really bad day. Well, um, one of the reasons why I asked that is, um, you know, I'm just hap I happen to think of uh, one of the near death experience uh, people that we've interviewed on the podcast, Evan Alexander. Yeah. And, um, you know, some other near death experience um, that have happened medically can't be explained because you shouldn't be alive or unconscious or, you know, not breathing for X amount of time. So that's right. one of the reasons why I just asked to know, because a lot of people like to debunk some of this stuff and what you're seeing and people like to compare science and prove that it was probably humanly impossible for you to have been gone that long, or maybe your heart stopped, or maybe you were still breathing, or maybe you slipped into a coma. So um, I was just, that was kind of well, the intent. I, I would re rely upon Raymond Moody to answer that. He, he coined the term near-death experience because he's both a medical doctor and a doctor of philosophy, wrote the um, book that opened this all up, Life After Life. And uh, he calls it near-death experience, he says, because um, actually you can't define death. You know, um, one of my people that I admire greatly who had a near-death experience, Dr. Mary Neal, was underwater for 30 minutes. Right, yeah. Um, came out and came back. Now, um, it's impossible. She, sh she shouldn't have survived. She should have been brain damaged. She had two broken legs, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's all, but you can make the argument, well, she didn't really die because she came back. And that's what, I mean, Mu didn't use her as an example, but he said, um, you can't, we, we don't really understand. Death is a process. It's not like a light switch. It's not on and off. Mm -hmm. um, for example, your fingernails and hair grow for two years after you die. Mm -hmm. um, so the body's shutting down, you know, um, that's, that's the process. So, um, I mean, I say I died. Um, every doctor I've ever talked to said, you should have died. Um, you must have died, but uh, you can't, you can't prove any of this what i what i was what i was given was a gift and the gift was an experience of what dying meant yeah so back to your wife it sounds like she's the one that has been with you through this entire experience and transformation and she has stuck with you whereas some of the people well, that she divorced me oh she did yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you get back together a... are you still together no, she... no she's an attorney Oh, okay. All right. So, so she, that relationship she, she didn't last. How, no, she knew how to get her done. She did it. Okay. Got it done. Okay. So I, I wasn't I clear dumped. about that. I got, I got dumped. I wasn't sure if maybe she was still with you and could, you know, speak to the transformation of who you were, but she might've been one of those people that didn't like how you were transforming oh, yeah. after this experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, she stopped talking about Jesus I don't want to go to church, you know, stop reading the, don't read the Bible to me. I hate it and stuff like that. So I was trying to convert her because I didn't want to go to hell. Mm -hmm. But, but that's, that's the thought that I want to challenge you on just a little bit more because, yeah. you know, to convert or to want to share this experience is wonderful and great. But I also feel like through your experience, can't you sit with that, um, 
that comfort in knowing that God will give anyone a chance to be able to accept him at the moment of death? No, I mean, that's a really good point. Absolutely, yes. Um, And that's my hope. So what I, I'm not, um, I am not a forceful evangelist. I try and do it with love and kindness and relationship and stuff like that. I'm, I gave up the, you know, I'm trying to cajole people. It doesn't work. I, I absolutely convinced. It's a matter of fact, I think it's counterproductive mm-hmm. to um, try to forcefully convert people. I'm, I'm of the much more subtle, Hey, let's go out to eat, you know, talk. How's your life? You know, right. Kind of, um, more sneaky kind of evangelist, <laughs> but um, like the Sunday school teacher who planted the seeds in me, that's what I, I think that's my job. Right. My job isn't to, my job isn't to fix or change anyone. And I don't think it's anybody's job to do that. And I don't think you can either. Right. My I'd job agree. is to try and be a loving, caring influence. And some people want it and some people don't. And uh, if they don't want it, you know what? I don't I don't talk about um, faith at all with people who aren't interested. Mm-hmm. No. Yes. I, I, I have other topics. Like I'm a dog lover. I like to talk about dogs. Um, I did notice your dog. Um, <laughs> He's in the background. I'm a, yeah. I'm a, yeah, I'm an I'm a avid flower gardener. And mm-hmm. I love to talk about landscaping. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've built many houses. Um, I, I can talk construction, the R value of your house, and you know, I, there's lots of things that I'm, I'm conversing on that have nothing to do with faith. Yeah, well, you also, know, I cook. oh, I'm a, I'm trying to be a good cook. I made a wonderful sausage gumbo the other night. Oh, that sounds delicious. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've had a teacher, you know, say something similar who, you know, talks about love and being of service and making your life more about others than yourself, very similar to a lot of what you're saying. And, you know, his philosophy, too, is, you know, don't try to convince anybody of anything. Just just walk in the world and be in the world of who you are and allow that to be the seed. Um, I I couldn't agree more. And if they want to know more and say more, I mean, that's right. I can, you know, talk about the Bible. I went to seminary, you know, and, um, articulately, but there are not too many people that are interested in that topic, which is a topic that I would love to talk about. So that's why I hang out with a lot of clergy, because we, you know, can talk about things that are mutually, you know, interested. Sure. Well, Howard, this has been just, you know, a great discussion. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I'd also like you to let our listeners know where they can find your books, your website. So if they would like to read a little bit more about your experiences and what you have written about, um, that would be wonderful. So can you let our listeners know that information? Sure. My website is Howard Storm, my name, dot com. They just Google Howard Storm and they'll go to my website and um, there's links to Amazon to my four books. Um, there's also um, a gallery of, um, I think there's about 80 paintings on there. I actually have hundreds of paintings, but um, I, I put a selection up on that. And um, there's also a little bit of bio stuff and there's a contact thing so they can... Uh, through the contact they can email me as well great and let me ask you just one question about one of your books it's the green one on amazon it's rather expensive it's like 75 dollars why is that so expensive <laughs> oh um let me just look up and i'll tell i'll tell you which one it is um, yeah it's um the british edition of my descent into death befriend god life with jesus it's $75. It's supposed to be $8.88. Yeah, when I click on your link to go to Amazon, it's the paperback is $73.55. That's crazy. I know. The Kindle Unlimited is doesn't cost anything, but I was like, oh, I wonder why that one is so expensive will, compared to the I'll, others. <laughs> I'll have to look that up because it's the price on that's supposed to be $8.88. Whew, okay. That's a, a big mistake there. All right, well, good. I'm but glad I, I pointed that I, out. I'm glad you... Uh, pointed that out to me because I, of course, would like that book to be accessible. 
Yeah, and if you haven't gotten any sales, that might be why. Because I noticed your other books. It's not selling very well. Yeah, your other books, you know, are reasonable and, you know, stuff like that. And I went to this one. I was like, oh, I wonder how many pages this is. Why is it selling for $73? Is it a, you know, it's pretty expensive. So anyway, but yes, (laughs) you're welcome. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. And for uh, those listeners who enjoyed listening to Howard, please head on over to his website, howardstorm.com. Check out his books and um, reach out to him if if you'd like. So thanks again. It's a pleasure meeting you, April. Thanks again, everyone, for listening to this week's show. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you to listen to our new podcast, Mindbenders. Visit mindbenderspodcast.com to hear my dad's synchronistic story, I Hope It'll Bend Your Mind, about Jimi Hendrix. Then submit your story if you think it can bend our minds. Also be sure to check out the video replays of the 2020 Virtual Afterlife Conference. We have over 17 hours of amazing presenters exploring the survival of consciousness after death, working with hospice professionals, physicians, mediums, clergy, counselors, and alternative healers to offer a deeper understanding of death and beyond.